first Wednesday is very simple. We just want to do two things. We want to worship and we want to preach the word of God. Let's three things because then we're going to respond to God's word tonight, okay? That's all we're going to do. No announcements, no nothing except that. That's the purpose of First Wednesday. And so uh, tonight we have an incredibly special guest. Rich Wilkerson is with us tonight. And uh, Pastor Rich has been with us several times before here at our church at various stages of our history. But let me just say real quick that uh, for a little more than 20 years, a pa an evangelist who's traveled all over the world, I reminded him today that he preached youth convention when I was a teenager. I know we look the same age, but... He's a little older than me, and uh, but for the last 20 years has been pastoring uh, a, a, a conglomeration, is not the right word, a, a bunch of churches in the Miami area, and this past Sunday, uh, all of the churches that are part of his family had about 12,000 people, and so Peacemakers is the ministry that he is part of, and uh, it, it's a very... Uh, uh, eclectic part of Miami with a lot of different uh, people groups. I believe 67% of Miami was born outside the United States. I think that's the, the statistic he gave us. And so God has called him to just reach people in that part of the world and to partner reaching all over the world. But uh, this is a man who has been everywhere and knows everybody. And I just want to encourage you, he chose to be with us tonight. I want you to give Pastor Rich Wilkerson a great grace welcome as he comes to preach God's word for us tonight. Come on, church. Give him a great welcome tonight. Wow-wee. Hallelujah. Come on, give Jesus some praise tonight, everybody. Oh, man, he's such a good God. Now, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would fall upon us and that we would hear a word from heaven. And that people's lives would be changed, all people in this room tonight. May we never forget it, I pray. In Christ's name we ask it. Everybody said, yeah. amen. You may be seated. Uh, I want to just say it's an unbelievable honor to be here at Grace. Uh, I was here <clears throat> a number of years ago at some event that I spoke at for pastor. And it was, I think it was before you moved in to this uh, building. And they were taking me through it today. And uh, I'm just so honored to be here, and I, I want to thank you for standing with uh, some of the greatest pastors in America, um, Pastor Wayne and Tracy uh, Murray, who th this is the real deal, Holyfield. Uh, this is no joke, and the Bible says to give honor to whom honor is due, and I honor these great leaders. God bless your heart. Wow, wait. Amazing. And I also want to say what a joy it is to have met the pastoral staff uh, today in a great session we had together, um, a, kind of a leadership session this afternoon. And uh, my dear friends who are new to your church family, uh, Matthias and Daniela um, Grin, are, are very close friends of ours uh, from Miami. We knew them for years and couldn't believe they moved all the way up here, away from Miami where God lives on a regular basis. And anyway... But they came and uh, love uh, Matthias and uh, Daniela so much. By the way, uh, I'm so thrilled, Pastor. We got the, we got the word out um, this afternoon late because we found out, shocking, that uh, these two uh, front rows here, we don't know how it happened. You, probably this morning with the power out near the, But both of these two front rows this morning or late last night, um, covered with cooties. <laughs> and so we, there wasn't enough time to get, there's a special wash and the whole thing. So that's being done early in the morning. These will be ready for Sunday again. So, because in our church, these are the two choice rows. And God, if you put cooties on the choices seats, uh, I'd like to kill the devil for that. But anyway, that'll, that'll be all cleaned up tomorrow and available Sunday. Hallelujah. Can you say amen, church? Oh, man. Um, tonight, uh, I want to give you my testimony. Uh, I'm 100 years old, but God's been good to me. And I want to kind of tell you how I came to be um, a preacher of the gospel. And I just have uh, two verses that most of you are very, very familiar with. I mean, it seems like to me, if you go to church on Wednesday night, you're going to heaven. I mean, let's just, you know, 
I have no authority in that category, but I just thought it'd be a nice thing to say. I mean, I just can't believe this many people came on a Wednesday night. Bless your heart. But some of you, maybe most of you, know about these two verses. Very simple. From Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I was so blessed to be born and raised into a pastor's family. And my father uh, was my hero. He's in heaven with Jesus now, but he was the greatest man I ever knew. And I got married to a, a lady whose father became the other greatest man I ever knew. Both of them pastors, very blessed. But early on, uh, I just lived for God. I mean, I wanted to be like my dad. My dad was one of the few people in the world that, I, I, he, I mean, he promoted happy legalism. I, I don't know how else to put it. I mean, we couldn't do anything. You know, a hundred years ago, Pentecostals, everything was a sin. And we, 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 we couldn't go to dances. You know, we, we, we couldn't go to movies. It was a sin to go to some kinds of ball games. Uh, if there was betting there, he couldn't go there. And so my dad would go say, well, you know, so we don't do that. And I'd go, right, all right. We don't dance. I won't go to the prom. Yes. You know, and I, I didn't know what I was even, you know. But that dad was excited about it, so I was excited about it. You know what I'm saying? Um, anything my dad said I did, I, he's the greatest man I ever knew. He was a joyful man. He's just full of joy, the joy of Jesus. And he used to say to me all the time, you know, son, when you live for God, there's peace and love and joy and so much more. Peace and love and joy and some. And, man, that's what I would say to all my buddies at high school. I'd say, you know, guys, if you live for Jesus, there's peace and love and joy and more. And They'd be like, you're an idiot, you know, because we were in public school. We played football together, and um, we practiced behind the stadium on Lake Michigan. And um, my dad was at some of the practices. He was at all the games. He prayed over all of our public school events, you know. Uh, that's how old I am. Uh, they didn't get the news in Wisconsin that was illegal, and so... Uh, Dad just kept praying. He prayed at my high school graduation at the big university. It was crazy. Anyway, um, I told my, and I lived for God all the way through high school. I mean, I remember uh, Friday nights, you know, we'd, we'd have games, and after the game, we'd be in showering up, you know, changing. The, and all my buddies would be going to parties, get drunk, you know, messing around with their girlfriends, all that stuff. And they'd say to me, well, Wilkerson, we, we suppose you won't be going with us again. I go, no, 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 I won't be, uh, won't be going out. I got other plans tonight after the game, other plans. And they'd say, well, we'll see you Monday. And I'd always say, maybe. they go, well, what do you mean? And I'd go, well, you know, rapture. Uh, you know, Jesus, come before Monday. I'm going to heaven. You guys going straight to hell. You already know. I've told you that. But have, have, a, great, have a great weekend, y'all. And the... I promise you, my, my, my closest friends were like, okay, that's great. You know, they're going to slip out and, and just kind of scared. In fact, a number of them got saved before we graduated. They just got scared out of hell and into heaven is basically what we did, okay? But really, God helped me to, to go through school, be a witness. Uh, I, I've been back to my schools in that area and, and given public school assemblies, and it's been a miracle. But when I graduated, I went to North Central Bible College in Minneapolis, and uh, it, 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 it took Bible college to drive me away from God. I, I don't know what else to say. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible thing to say, but uh, I, I got to North Central. This was 1970 I get to North Central. I was a freshman. Had always lived for God. All the tests, all the stuff stood strong for it. Got to North Central, and we had about 400 students in the school, and um, it took me about, I don't know, a month to learn that <laughs> nobody was living for God there. Nobody. W excuse me. One guy. One guy, his name was Rocky Grams. Rocky came from a missions family. Uh, his entire 
family historical missionaries around the world. And Rocky was the only person saved at North Star. There's no doubt in my mind. I mean, he was perfect. As far as we know, even to this day, he's never sinned. <laughs> and uh, um, Rocky Grams went at the same time to North Central Bible College which is now North Central University, and at the same time went to the University of Minnesota at the same time, carried a full load at both schools at the same time, and graduated two days apart from each school with a 4.0 average from each school. I suppose for Rocky it was easier to be saved because there was no time to sin in his life. Anyway, so... Uh, today he pastors our Assemblies of God University in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, one of the places where the greatest revival probably in the world has been on for about 30 years, all through Argentina and around Latin America. And so many of the students come out of Rockies University. Um, it, it was a tough time. I, mean, I remember going, and it was during the hippie movement, and uh, I remember going, I mean, people would smoke anything they could roll. And... Um, <laughs> I remember one day going into a cafe uh, in Minneapolis to get a bite to eat before I left for work. And there was a guy sitting and facing me in the booth across from me. And he was just toast. I, I don't know how to. He was so stoned, completely out of his brains. And he's just standing there, just looking into space. And he reaches and takes a bread stick out of the, out of the bread basket. And he takes a bread. And he, he bit the end of it and bit the and, and, and he, he lit it. <laughs> and, and he started smoking the breadstick. And he didn't order anything. Water. Uh, that, that was it. Uh, it was just a crazy time in, in American history. And um, at that time, uh, all freshmen coming to North Central, by the way, North Central Day is one of the great universities in America. And I'm going to tell you one of the reasons why in just a moment. But during that time, every incoming freshman had to be on a ministry team, which meant you had to be in a traveling singing group. Uh, you had to be in a local church leading some kind of a children's or youth something or other. Or you could be in one of the two major choirs. And one of the choirs was called the Gospel Hymns. And there were 40 of us men. There, it was like girl-free, you know, ministry. No girls allowed. And, and it was gospel hymns because, you know, we were, it, uh, we were all men. So it was kind of a play on words were the gospel hymns. <laughs> but it was spelled H-Y-M-N-S. So see the play? You get it? it, it, it pick. So, in other words, we are hymns, but we sing hymns. <laughs> and we had tuxedos and bow ties and, and, and short hair because it was illegal to have long hair. That was a sin. <laughs> and we were traveling around the country for two weeks at spring break in a broken down bus landing in churches on a Monday night with 13 people and 40 men on the stage. A mighty fortress is our... And people are going, can you give them a breadstick? I mean, it, seriously, because they thought we were on something. <laughs> it was a miserable two weeks. Terrible things done by us hymns while we were singing Jesus and doing stuff after. It was crazy. I remember coming home all night from Illinois, driving all night to get back on Monday. Uh, so many guys had to get back to work, and then school started Tuesday morning. I didn't have to be work till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I got about 7 o'clock in the morning, unloaded the buses back at the school. And then my father pastored a church in Minneapolis at the time, uh, which later became Christ Church. But at that time, it was the Minneapolis Gospel Tabernacle. So I went over to see my father before I, I, I went, you know, to the dorm and got, went to bed. And um, as I went to my dad's office, Monday morning, 9 o'clock. It's Monday morning, 9 o'clock. 
And as I go to knock on dad's door, I hear people and they're praying. Just, I mean, praying, crazy praying. My God! And they're in tongues and it's just... Uh, it's, it, and, and, and so I open the door and there's like 20 people on Monday morning praying in the whole... It's crazy praying. And, and I started to say, hey dad, when this woman steps in front of my face and she goes, you must be Richard. She had this British accent. I'd never seen her in my life. I had no idea who she was. The Lord's been speaking to me all week long about you, son. You have big problems in your life. Come with me now. And she had like an authoritarian deal going. Plus, she had a British accent. Now, Americans... We're not so much into Chinese accents or Spanish accents, but if you've got an English accent, it's like you are of God. I don't know. Charlton Heston, Moses, you could tell he was of God because he had a British accent as Moses. And this woman had such a British I went, my God, I got to go. She said, so we headed downstairs. I never even sat out of my dad. We're heading downstairs to the prayer room at the Minneapolis Gospel Tabernacle. And I, I'm, I'm following her downstairs. I haven't slept for about nine hours. We've been on a bus all night. And, and, and so I'm heading downstairs. I feel like I'm in the twilight zone. And we get downstairs to the prayer room. And there was a chair over here and there was a chair. She goes, now, here's what the Lord says to me. I'll just speak English now. She said, you've got such a big problem and God wants to take the problem away. Because of this problem, you haven't been able to hear the voice of God as to what you're supposed to do next year. And if you'll get this problem taken care of today, which you're going to, God will show you what you're supposed to do. Now, let me just say this. I wasn't sure what she thought my problem was, but I know I didn't know what to do next year. I definitely wasn't going back to this phony baloney school where nobody was saved except Rocky Graham's, and I was messed up now, too. I was working full-time at this organization called FMC Corporation. I thought maybe I would just keep working there and rise up the chain, eventually take the company over, 3,000 guys, become a millionaire, or go to the University of Minnesota, take my business degree, and become a millionaire. Either way, I was going to become a millionaire. I was done with this. And a millionaire meant a lot more then than it does now, but it's still pretty good. But I'm just saying, uh, it was like a billionaire. They, anyway, so... She says, here's what we're going to do. She said, I'm going to kneel here, and you're going to go over there, and you're going to pray, and, and God's going to speak to you and take care of your problem. Now go over there, and you kneel there. I'm going to kneel here. So, you know, you guys, I didn't want to go over there and kneel down there. I was in my brain. I'm cursing. Have you ever cursed under your, you know, like you would never say it out loud, but on the inside, don't sit there and lie to me, sitting there acting like you've never done. Stop it. So anyway, I had, I'm just mad. I'm so mad. And I'm heading over there. And, and you know, oh, God, Jesus. He, oh, I'm not so mad. God, I'm thank you. I was afraid of her. I was, the, I was afraid. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm so mad. I'm cursing on the inside. And I'm so upset. And I'm mad. But I got to tell you something, folks. Something happened from right here to right here within a matter of about three seconds. Did you see the three foot drop from here to, I went from cursing to weeping like a woman, like a flood of tears on this tin chair. And I'm just laying all the sins I've ever committed in my life on that chair and crying out to God, begging him to forgive me, cleanse me, Jesus, make me right. And when I, it was about 10 minutes, all of a sudden that all stopped and I had a vision. Now I got to tell you something, I've never had a vision before or since. I think they're a little strange, but I had a vision. And I saw what looked like Niagara Falls. But instead of water coming over the Niagara Falls, there were millions and billions and trillions of N's and C's and B's and C's. We used to call North Central Bible College NCBC. That's what we called it. I mean, there were, there were millions of N's and B's, the trillions of C's because there was two C's. And so just, just, just pouring like water over the Niagara Falls. It's, and, and I felt like it's pouring into my head and into my heart. I felt like God was saying, stay at North Central Bible College. And five minutes 
Vision's gone. Tears are on the deal. I'm like in it. I haven't slept for nine hours. I, I'm losing it. I'm completely losing it. I'm crying, and then I'm saying stuff that I'm repenting, and then I see stuff. Okay. Now, I, I, I think, so, so I get up. I, I'm going to go see. Now, this lady, by the way, is a lady by the name of Joy Dawson. She was, for so many years, one of the main leaders of Youth With a Mission International, one of the greatest women of God preachers in the history of the world, as far as I'm concerned. I believe Sister Dawson is still alive, but she's from New Zealand. And I'm heading back to her. Now, folks, in those days, you, there was no shame to the gospel. Sister Dawson is over here while I'm praying, getting right with her. She's pounding on the chair. Get a hold of his wretched soul. And, I mean, you know, it just, it's, it's just not hip. That's not seeker sensitive. Just, just, you know, just like get, you know. And, and so I, I said, hello. Because yeah, I'm just so afraid of her. And just, it's too, he said, what is it? I said, well, I said, um, I think maybe uh, the Lord's, you think. Why, son, you can know. I said, really? She said, yes. What you need is scriptural confirmation. And I didn't, it sounded like a technical thing that I wasn't versed in. I said, what does that mean? She goes, that's when the Lord gives you scripture to back up what he told you in the spirit. You've received a rhema word. Now you need a logos word. I'm, what are you, okay. I said, I don't have a Bible. No problem. And she picks up, you know, in those, during the Jesus movement, which was during the hippie movement, we carried family Bibles because we weren't ashamed of the gospel. You know, the, the, the family, the picture, by the huge ones. And she picked, she's like, okay, help me. Okay. And she put the Bible. And she, I said, now go over there. The Lord's going to give you chapter and verse. So I had, a, and I had this Bible it was as big as Montana, and I'm heading over, and I said, God, I am begging you to give me scriptural consideration because if you don't, that woman will kill me. I mean, I just felt like she was going to kill me. And, and I knelt down, and I knelt down, and the Lord said, James 4. Well, there wasn't a verse, just James 4. So quickly I turned to table of contents. I found out what page that was on. And I flipped over to James chapter 4. And I read down the whole chapter. And it was a good chapter, but it didn't make much difference to me. Until I got to verse 17. And verse 17 said, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I said, Mrs. Dawson, the Lord said, Stop! 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 Don't tell me what he said. We're going to go upstairs, and we're going to tell your father what your problem was, the two answers God gave you, and I'm going to tell you, the answer God gave you, I'm going to tell you the two reasons why God told you to do what he told you to do. Now, folks, this was getting so weird because I hadn't even told her what my problem was. We get upstairs, my dad and these people, and the janitors and pastors, they're just weeping. We open the door, and he goes, she goes, Pastor John, your son's been in deep sin. My dad goes, I go, ah. She goes, it's okay. It's okay. She goes, he, he just got right with God. He just repented of his sin. My dad goes, oh, thank God. You know, and, I'm like, she was, and I said, how did you know that? She said, the Lord told me. I said, man, that's amazing. She didn't even know me. He's had a big problem. His problem, he doesn't know what to do next year with his life. He thought he was supposed to go to the University of Minnesota. That wasn't it. He thought he was supposed to take over his company and make a million dollars. That wasn't it. I said, who told you that? She said, the Lord told me. The Lord told him to stay right where he is at North Central Bible College, which is now North Central University. I said, how did you? She said, stop. There's two reasons why God wants him to stay. God is going to send a revival to that school in the fall of his sophomore year that is unparalleled in the history of of the school. Right away I went false prophet. She's never been to our school. She doesn't know that of the 400 students that are studying for the ministry, by the way, only Rocky Grahams is saved. I know that. So that's not going to happen. She is a false prophetess. Jesus, oh God, help her. And now I'm starting to get holy, see? And she was the second reason is because God wants him to experience this revival in the fall because in the spring of his sophomore year, God is going to thrust him into full-time Christian service. I want that too. 
She's a false prophet. I just had to look up what page James 4 is on. I don't think I'm going to be preaching the gospel in less than a year. But I forgot what she said. I just knew I was supposed to go back to North Central. Got to North Central first day of school. I'm sitting on the front row with Rocky Grams. Rocky and I were the only saved people that we knew in the school. Now, he had gained one brother because of the miracle in my life in the spring. About a month into school, we had Spiritual Emphasis Week. Spiritual Emphasis Week at a Christian university is the one week a year where you become spiritual. The other weeks are pretty much carnal emphasis weeks. <laughs> but the one week is you get real holy. Oh, hallelujah. You pass your friends. Oh, oh, oh. yes. Don't you feel it? Oh, yes. And you don't know what any of that means, but you're talking real religious talk. you know. And um, the year before we had a man speak for a week, you got to come to church at night too. And there'd be 25 people at night out of 400 students. So this young man was coming from the West Coast. His name was Dick Eastman. He was 27 years old. We'd never heard of him. Our school had never heard of him. And Dick arrives on a Monday morning, stands up, and they introduce him, and people are already kind of making fun of him because he's so young. You can't be that young and have a spiritual emphasis week. We need old people that you can't understand. I'm telling you, this is not going to work. And so Dick... Before, he goes, before I speak, the Lord showed me 10 things that are going to happen this week while I was on the plane from the West Coast coming here. And he didn't get real excited about it. He just started down this list of 10 things. And these 10 things were specific, weird stuff. It wasn't like, first of all, there's going to be a giant blessing. What does that mean? It, nothing like that. It was pointed, specific things that you could measure and judge. He gets down about point number five, and people in the back are sitting up going like, dear God, if this stuff happens, we're dead. <laughs> I mean, guys, I mean, bad guys were just going, we're dead. This is really bad. This is going to be bad. This stuff, if this doesn't happen, that's the biggest liar that's ever been on this campus, bigger than us. But if it does happen, we're dead. We're dead people. And I mean, this, there was like a general nervousness, not so much conviction, just sheer nervousness in the auditorium. He gets down about past point number seven, and he looks, he goes, hey, you, right here, stand up right now. And this kid stands up. We knew him, Johnny. And Dick goes, you've been involved in this, 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 on these dates. Boom, 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 boom. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you something. We knew Johnny. We knew what he did. Some of them were there that night. And, and guys are just like, how do you know I did? He goes, get in the aisle. So Johnny steps in the aisle. And Dick runs down. Now, let me tell you, this was during the days of a woman by the name of Catherine Kuhlman. Now, we, had, we lived in Minneapolis. We'd never heard of her, okay? But Catherine Kuhlman was a, a saint, healer, woman of God. If she touched you, you could not stand up. Impossible to stand. If she touched you at the altar, flat out. You're flat out. But we'd never seen that in our lives and never heard of her. Dick says, get in the aisle. This guy steps in the aisle. Dick runs down the aisle and just touched. He goes, in the name of Jesus. So he hadn't said anything to set it up. He just going to just tell you, in the name of Jesus. When he touched that guy, boom, I mean, I'm, you guys, I'm talking flat out. Now, there, this building, I noticed when I came, has a pitch to it. So if you're sitting in there, you can see kind of what's going on. There. No pitch in that old auditorium. It was just flat. We had no, people had no clue. Guys in the back of the auditorium jump up. My God! Oh, my God! Because they thought that God had opened up the floor like Cora, Dathan, and Abiram and killed Johnny. They said, he killed, and the guys are going, he killed Johnny, oh dear God, God killed Johnny. Where did, and Dick goes, you over here, stand up. This kid goes, no, no, not. He goes, get up. 
This guy stands up. He goes, you've been involved in this, this, this. On these dates, they boom, boom, boom. Get in the aisle. The kid screams out, not the aisle. Get in the aisle. He runs down, lays his hand flat out. I promise under Jesus. That prayer meeting did not end until 6.30 that night from 9.30 in the morning with every student slain in the power of God across chairs, over pianos, over other students. It was gone. And in the spirit, people, what they used to call drunk in the spirit, I've never seen anything like it prior to that in my life. We had to pick people up off the floor at 6.30 to get them over to the dorm rooms to shower up because it stunk in there. There was The old auditorium had no ventilation, so it stunk in. Had to get them so they could get cleaned up and get back for the service. I'm going to tell you something. Before the students could get changed and back, the place was jammed. And then the students had to sit out in the hallways. Let me tell you something. I am 100% for marketing, and our church in Miami markets and pays money for it every month. But I'll tell you something, church. When the Holy Ghost of God touches a city, people will swim to get to your church. By Wednesday night, all five floors of the administration building, it's still there were jammed with students, couldn't get into the auditorium. And he, he would preach, and then everybody would be slain the spirit till the next morning. All classes were canceled for a week. The power of God. Students gave everything they had in the last offering for missions, $27,000 in cash 45 years ago from students that were broke, and then $100,000 worth of stuff, cars, Boats, leather jackets, anything that had worth. Wedding rings were turned. It took them years to sell everything to give it to missions. That school was changed that week from this point on. That is one of the great Holy Ghost universities in the world today. And some of you heard Dr. Scott Hagen just a few weeks ago. That's my first cousin. And I'm telling you something, friends, I, I know that that kind of Holy Ghost revival is fixing to blow across that campus one more time before this is over. I was changed. I joined a, a group of guys. None of us could sing, but we started a singing group. And we started singing and preaching all over the Twin Cities and then all over the five-state region. We started traveling across America. And one night I got home about 3 in the morning from a trip. And I, on my phone was a, 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 a call from my uncle in Fort Worth, Texas. He said, call me in the morning. And I called him the next day. He said, Rich, we've heard about the revival. This was in February in Minneapolis. I want you to come here and be our youth pastor. And I want you to bring the revival to Fort Worth, Texas. We've got to have revival down here. And that's what started happening to young men and women throughout that school. Please bring the revival to our city. This is to students, not to you know, the president of the universe. This is from students. Students started. And, and, and my wife and I, I wasn't married yet, but I just met Robin. And I told her what had happened. She said, you've got to go check it out. I said, but I'm not done with school. And I went down and... God spoke to my heart, but not to go there. And he said, what do you want? What, when are you coming? I said, I can't say yes. He said, don't say anything now. Go home and pray for two weeks. I went home and prayed for two weeks. And, folks, I'm going to tell you something. I couldn't hear God. It was like my prayers were bouncing off the ceiling. And one night I came home from work, and I, the Bible was on, on my bed. I've read it all the time now. And I was in a suit, and I fell on top of that bed on that Bible. The Bible's bouncing on my chest. And the Holy Spirit said, turn to Jeremiah 1. I hadn't heard that in two weeks. Turn to Jeremiah 1, kind of like James 4. I knew what Jeremiah 1 had in it. And I got to tell you something, friends. I was afraid to go to Fort Worth because I was only 19 years of age. I had only started seriously wanting to know what the Bible said so I could preach it. I thought it was too early. And I opened to Jeremiah 1, and my eyes fell on verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Many theologians believe Jeremiah was about 16 when God called him. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, 
oh, but Lord, I can't go. I'm but a child. He was saying the same thing I was saying. I'm too young. I can't do this. I'm too young. The Lord said, say not that I'm a child. You shall go to all that I shall send you to. Are you hearing this, young adults in this room? Whatever I command you to speak, you will speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, saith the Lord God Almighty. I literally started weeping. I picked up the phone. It was now past midnight. I called my uncle, and I said, God, talk to me. I'm coming. He said, that's great. I'm sleeping. Call me in the morning. Here's the deal. When God speaks to you, it won't make a hill of beans bit of difference to the person sitting three people away from you, but it'll change your life. And I took that word from God that night. My life was so changed. And a few months, I was there full time as the youth pastor. Within a few months, Rob and I got married. I was 20. She was 19. One thing led to another. We started winning people to Christ. I'm, folks, there was such an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We saw 200 street kids on heroin and, and every kind of drug you can imagine. LSD was the drug of choice in those days. It would come into our Bible studies on Tuesday night, be delivered from demonic oppression, set free and, and baptized in the Holy Ghost and changed by the power of God. They would enter Bible college. Some of them are preachers today in our churches because they heard the good news. We took the... I remember baptizing every Sunday night people from our Bible study getting saved. I didn't know how to baptize. So I'd baptize and the water would roll over the tank onto all the women's hairdos. And, and my uncle said, Rich, you got to work that out because the women, you'll pay to get their hair done for Sunday. And they're in the choir for heaven's sakes. We don't pay them. You can't destroy. They got to go to work in the morning, you know. So we worked it out. I'm just saying God moved. But there came a point where I was given an opportunity to go to Sacramento, California to the largest church in our organization at that time, and God moved by his spirit. And about three or four years into it, I began to be so attractive to other churches that I was flying all over the country at the age of 24 and 25 to preach in conferences and youth uh, meetings. And I'd get back in time for Sunday and and, and, and there came a point in my life, and I want you to hear me tonight, where I, I, I was in the ministry and I was kind of far from God. I could preach like no other young man in, in, in our state at that time. And God would use me. The, the word of God will not return void. My wife and I were growing apart. She had an incredible business. We were like 25 years old, had brand new home, pool, jacuzzi, drove an orange, orange Corvette, all for the glory of God. This was before the prosperity message, hello. <laughs> and I guess all along I was looking for that and more part because I had the love, I had the joy, I had the peace that daddy talked to me about. But he never told me about the and more part. And, and, and nothing that came my way, prosperity, victory, applause, Plane trips every other weekend. Nothing moved me. No, nothing turned my crank anymore. I, was, I, I, I wasn't an act of, you know, sin, of uh, ugly. But I was far from God. And, and, and my wife really wanted to separate. She was done with me. We were seven years into marriage. You've heard of the seven-year itch. She said, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. And, and, and I said, just, just wait a minute. I, nobody knew this. And, and, and I, I said to the staff on Friday, I said, I'm going to just stay for a couple hours. You go, going home, I'll lock up. And I told the janitor, just go. I said, I'm going to lock up. I'm going to stay and just pray. And that night, I, I laid on my office floor, and I said, God, I said, I need, I need to know the Ann Moore part. I've been looking at it since the revival at North Central, and I've had great Holy Ghost victory. You've blessed me like nobody. But I've been looking for Ann Moore, and I just don't know what it is. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me for the first time in months and said, Rich, the Ann Moore part's the cross part. Sometimes I don't let a young man or a young woman know about it until I believe they're ready. And I want to take you onto a journey into the cross. That night, I stayed that. That's when we didn't have a computer. 
we had encyclopedias. <laughs> and I had Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> My God. And I started looking at the ancients, the early church. I started looking at the Christian martyrs. And, and, and I read how St. Mark had been dragged to death by the people of Alexandria for being a follower of Christ. Uh, I, I read how St. Thomas was hung on a tree in southern India. He was the one that took the gospel to India. I read how Luke was thrust through with a spear and then hung upside down. For the cause of Christ. I, I read about that night how St. Peter, as they were getting ready to crucify him, he said to his accusers, I have one request. I, I don't, I, I'm not worthy to, to, to die the way my Lord died. Please crucify me upside down. And so they jammed Peter's head upside down into the earth. The, the blood rushed to his head and in time it burst through his Brain, veins, and capillaries. I read how Paul the Apostle was beheaded at Rome. I, I, I kept reading through church history. I, I, I read how Jesus, as he hung on the cross uh, before he died, how as he hung suspended between heaven and earth, his, the scientists that write say that his pectoral muscles began to go into spasms. And when they would go into spasms hanging on the cross, he could inhale, but he could not exhale. And the only way Jesus could breathe freely on the cross would be to pull up on the nails in his hands and push up on the nails in his feet until he was above the nails. He could breathe. But then when he could no longer stand, the pain in his hands and feet would fall back onto the nails. And, and once again, then the pectorals would be going to spasms. He could not breathe. And he would pull himself back up and push up. Ah! Ah! Until he died of a broken heart. His heart physically burst, science tells us, because of sorrow. I read how during the Catholic Inquisition, during a time when the church was better known for its torture chambers than it was its connect groups and Bible studies, this one incredible man of God, the priest of Florence, Italy, Girolamo Savonarola, daily at St. Mark's Cathedral in Florence, would preach five times a day. And every time the man of God would preach the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ, people from all over Florence would jam every service five, until he became a stench in the nostrils of the leaders at Rome. One day they walked into the back of St. Mark's and they dragged Savonarola from the pulpit, parish pulpit, out the back and they took him to a stretching post and they laid him on a stretcher and began to stretch him in the prison and then every day they would take him out to the center of Florence, Italy and they would tie a rope around his waist and hoist him to the top of a 15 foot pole. They would drop him from that 15 foot pole 10 and 12 times a day, every day until finally after the stretching and the dropping of his body to the earth over and over they say that every bone in Savonarola's body was crushed and so that the infection was pouring from his pores in his hands and feet and arms and legs with infection. They wouldn't even let the man of God die in peace. They dragged him from his cell room to the center of Florence. They tied his ankles around a post, his knees to the post, his loins to the post, his chest to the post, his head to the post, and they built a kindling at his feet and they lit it. 50,000 people from Florence, Italy gathered around as they watched their favorite priest burned at the stake 
As he was burning at the stake, witnesses that were there say that one of the leaders from Rome screamed from a balcony nearby, Savonarola, from the church militant and the church triumphant, we excommunicate you. Historians say that he raised his broken head one final time, summoned every ounce of breath in his lungs, and screamed in one sentence his finest message ever. He said, Sir, from the church militant, you may excommunicate me. However, from the church of Jesus Christ triumphant, you may never, 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 never excommunicate me. And he died. Do you know why they could not throw him out of the church of Jesus Christ triumphant? It is for the same reason that Jesus looked in the face of Peter and said, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When you're hooked up to the church of Jesus Christ, you cannot be defeated. I got off that carpet that night sobbing like a woman. And I went home to my wife and I said, baby, I'm resigning this place. I've become an arrogant punk and I'm resigning this place. And I know that you want to leave me. I'm just asking. I'm going to, I don't know what I'm going to do for a living, but I'm out of here. I'm going to trust God. I'm not going to trust this stuff. And she started to weep. And she said, Rich, this is what I've been waiting for. I've been waiting for the old Rich that I married. She said, I can't be a part of your life anymore. You're married to the church. It's like the church is your mistress. And I can't ever get in anymore. Baby, I'm ready to go. Let's go. And God opened the door for us into evangelism. For 18 years and 1,700 public high schools. And thousands of young people getting saved. And then... 20 years ago, he opened the door for us to move our family from the northwest to the ghetto of Miami, Florida. We have seen a miracle of God like none other. And I don't boast only in the cross of Christ, but he's been good to me. I want you to know something. Nothing is more important besides Jesus than the cross of Christ. I'm going to ask the band to come tonight. Singers, I'm going to ask you just to stay for a moment. I've gone too long. I was supposed to be done two minutes ago. But I, I just have, there's something on my heart in the way of an ending. Would you all just hold tight with me for this ending? Just let me do this ending. I feel the Holy Ghost is on me to do this ending. Would you just hang with me for a minute? I'm going to ask all of you in this room just to bow your head, every young adult. Every young couple, every mom, dad, every grandma, grandpa in this room. This is for everybody in this room. There's no age limits on what I'm going to say right now. This is for everybody in this room. And I feel this like, I feel this, I feel this like a bird from heaven on high. I feel like the Holy Ghost is in this room. And I'm serious. I feel the Spirit of God right now. And tonight, I'm going to pray. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. I want to give some instructions before I pray. I'm going to pray a short prayer. There's not going to be music, nothing. And when I say amen, if you're in this room tonight, I'm, I'm not saying all, you're all going to stand behind the pulpit. We believe that the ministry of the gospel is in the marketplace. This is one small part of it. I need preacher lawyers. God needs preacher doctors, preacher educators. You know what I'm saying? Going to all the world, preach the gospel. Every nook and cranny, every marketplace event. So, well, Pastor, I was, I was going to think I'm going to be a ball player. Preacher ball players. Preacher, preacher, preacher. But tonight you say, I'm, I'm so done with the devil's invasion of our country. I'm so done with everything's okay. I'm so done with the fact that you're okay. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm so done with the lack of righteousness. I want to see the power of God sweep our nation one more time. Pastor, whatever it is, I'm ready. I'm going to say amen. And with your head bowed, your eyes closed, when I say amen, I want you to wait about 15 seconds, 20 seconds. No response. 
But after about 15 or 20 seconds, there may be one or five or 70 in the room, I don't know. But if you're done with it all, and you're like me, I want you to stand to your feet and raise your right fist in the air, and I want you to scream, I want the cross! And just hold your position. I mean, scream it. Don't, don't stand up. I want the cross. I, I kind of want it. No, 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 no. I want you to belt it. I want the cross. And just hold your position. And I, I don't know if there'll be more than two people. I don't know if there'll be a hundred. I don't know if there'll be five. But I'm telling you, we are at a place in this nation, in this world, where we've got to have men and women of God so sold out to Jesus Christ that the devil will be afraid of us and afraid of this church. I'm going to pray. You've heard the instructions. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Lord Jesus, tonight I've, I've delivered my soul. I've shared my testimony. Now, Lord, I ask that you would do what I can't do. I ask that you would speak to the hearts of men and women, old men and women like me, and middle-aged men and women, and young couples, young families, and young adult men and women, teenage men and women, junior high men and women, and some kids, Jesus. That Lord God, tonight, they would go, enough is enough, you lying piece of scum devil. Enough's enough. And tonight, Lord, there'd be a few good men and women who'd say, I want the cross. I ask that you would speak to hearts even now, Jesus. Amen.
could ask everybody to stand your feet. because there was such consideration in the room during that time. I don't feel like a person stood because someone else stood. I don't impress. No, 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 no. There was thought put into it. There was consideration. I love you so much. I'm so proud of you. What a church. How? Did you mind just five more minutes? Would would y'all just, as, as they sing, would you guys just... Like we have our final prayer right here. Could everybody, I mean, from the from the bleacher sections and down, could you all just come to the front row and come in real tight? We're going to sing it, but just come in real tight. Just stand from one side to the other, as tight as you can get at this altar, as tight as you can get, from the very back all the way to the front. Hallelujah. Just come as you sing it. Come on. Let's sing it together. Come in. All these gaps. Come in real. I need you right at the front. This is important. We're going to wrap this. Touch someone in front of you if you have to. Just just squeeze in tight. Squeeze in tight. Come on in real close, everybody. Come in. Come in. this one time. We're not going to get freaky. Just this one time. I'm going to ask that most of the lights out there be turned down and just stage lights. All right? If we could just get stage lights. This is not to focus on me. It's to get our focus off of each other in the crowd. Okay? So here's what I'm going to do. Now, now let me tell I'm going to tell every young man, every young woman, let me tell you something. Every old man, every old woman, We need the Holy Ghost. Now, I don't care what you've been told. Maybe you came in as a guest tonight and you just freaked out when I said that. Stop. I'm 65 years old, and I I could not even be alive tonight if it wasn't for the Holy Ghost. He has saved my life over because he's my comforter. He's with me at all times. When Jesus ascended, he left the Holy Spirit as our comforter. All right? And when you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, when you speak in other languages, let me tell you what's happening. Romans chapter 8 towards the end of that chapter says, now listen to me, this is so important. When you pray in the Holy Ghost, tongues, you are praying the perfect will of God. The Bible says the Holy Spirit knows what the mind of God is and He prays through us many times have you ever prayed in English or whatever your native tongue is? You've prayed and you ran out of things to say, but there was a burden on your heart. You didn't know what it was. You ran out of things to say. You prayed for every missionary you could think of. You prayed for your family and you couldn't think of anything else, but there's a burden. Man, at that point, I start going into the Holy Ghost and all of a sudden after 10, 15, 20, sometimes three minutes, that burden lifts. I don't know what happened, but the burden lift, the answer came and the miracle took place. Here's what I want us to do tonight. Because when you stand and say, I want the cross, you're going to need the Holy Ghost. Because you're going to have, the enemy's going to do everything he can, take you down. And you know, I've I've come to this place in my life where I just go bring it. See what you got. And I'm not boasting. I I boast only in the cross of Christ. But but come what may, Jesus is going to hold us. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to do a spiritual exercise. 
How many believe that praying is a spiritual exercise? Fasting is a spiritual exercise. I mean, go right down the list. Devotion is a spiritual right? Witnessing. All, but praying is a spirit. Here's what I want us to do tonight. I want us to pray in the Holy Ghost for five minutes. Now, I've got a timer on my iPhone. So when I say one, two, three, go, I'm going to hit the timer. And I want you to raise your hand. Here's, what, here's what's going to happen. Can I give you some instruction? Here's what's going to happen. I've already instructed the band and the singers. They're going to sing and play as loud as they can. Okay? So that you don't get worried that someone's listening to you and what you're saying. Sometimes we get, oh, what do they think? I don't think I'm goofy. They won't even be able to hear you. It'll be so loud. Okay? They say, Pastor, I don't like it loud. I don't either. I lost my hearing because I sit on the front row of our church. I have hearing aids in tonight. I'm just telling you, I believe God's going to heal me, but not when I keep abusing my ears this bad. I'm just saying, I want to have the Holy Ghost move so that you're not distracted by silence. Okay? So I said, I want them to pray, worship God loud, and we're going to pray. So here's what we're going to do. Are you, are you all in for this? It'll be, uh, you know, when it gets to one minute, I'll go, one minute! And you'll keep praying. You won't stop. No singing. Only they can sing. We're all going to pray in the Holy Ghost. Then it gets to, I'll say, two minutes! And you'll just keep praying. Three minutes! You're going to think it's three hours. Trust me. I promise you. But we'll get five. At the end of the five minutes, we're going to go nuts. Then I'm going to bless you out. I know I've gone long, but I just want to get this in, okay? Please. All right, here we go. So we're going to raise our hands. All right, here we go. Hallelujah. You guys ready? You guys ready, Steve? Yeah, no, give me a second. Give me a second. Give us, okay, here we go. Don't, don't start yet. Don't start. Hey, hey, hey. Don't start. Wait a minute. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay. Here we go. Uh, okay, here we go. Keep keep going. Keep going. Um, stopwatch. Okay, here. Stopwatch. Okay, are you, are you guys ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Hands up. Okay. I want you in tongues and just rip it for five minutes. One, two, three. Start. Yeah.
in Miami and he's just written checks that's what he does, multi-millionaire he just writes checks when we come up short he writes a check the devil hit him three weeks ago with lung cancer for no reason he went in a week later the tumor had shrunk one centimeter the doctor said because it shrunk I can, I can surgically remove that he found out today it has not spread. It has not metastasized. It's not in any lymph nodes. And I just heard the Lord say, I just healed Greg. I just healed Greg. Now let me tell you something. There's people that you were praying for in the Holy Ghost that got healed while you were, they're in Mississippi, but they got healed. That salvation you've been believing for in a son or daughter, God put a hook in their jaw. Some of them, right, while, I, while we were praying in the Holy Ghost, put a hook in their jaw. Like the Old Testament prophets start drawing them back to the cross of Jesus Christ. They know the way to go. They've just been running. Hallelujah. And friends, I'm going to tell you something. We're not wrong. Now you look at me. Look at me. We're not wrong. Some of you said, oh boy, Pastor Rich, you get kind of radical. We're not wrong. I could have talked lighter and not so loud, and we could have prayed in tongues silently. The point is, however you do it, we're not wrong. This is the right thing. Jesus has always been the Savior, the Healer, the Baptizer, and the soon-coming King. And here's what the Lord spoke to me. A prophet came to my house about six weeks ago, and I... I've told Pastor Matthias, I'll, I'll talk to Pastor Wayne tonight. I hope he comes here. Most unusual testimony. I won't tell you the testimony. But he said, Rich, i, I got to give this to you. And he gave me a $1,200 brand new minted platinum coin. He said, now, I didn't have to give you this to give you this prophecy. I'm giving it to you because I believe this prophecy is right from God and you won't forget it. I said, what, what, what are you talking about, Charlie? He goes, God is laying on your heart at 65 a platinum anointing. A platinum anointing. I said, what does that mean? He said, platinum is used, for instance, in a catalytic converter in your car. And when the fumes, the fossil fuels come through your catalytic converter, it detoxifies those toxic fumes and sends them neutralized into the air. I don't know how to better say it. I'm not a scientist. But that, that's, he said, you're going to have a platinum anointing to be able to walk into situations that are toxic and when it's over, there'll be peace. Now, now friends, he said, you got to realize, Rich, as you age as a man of God or a woman of God, the anointing of the Holy Ghost is held in your bones. He said, you're going to have to get the weight off, Rich. You're going to have to get in shape, Rich, because the anointing God wants to bring on your life, you won't be able to bear the anointing if you're packing too much, if you know what I'm saying. Charlie has lost 40 pounds and is going for 50. And pretty soon, I think he'll be in this church and tell you the story. He said, Rich, at 85, Caleb said, give me my mountain. 
and he had to go in and take giants out. He said, I'm stronger now than when I was 40 and I went with you, Joshua. Give me my mind. And God gave it to him. You remember when Elisha died, his bones had been buried for several years and they threw a dead body on top of his bones and his body came back alive because the anointing was still in the bones. When Joseph died, he said to his boys before he died, hey, when I die, you get my bones out of this foreign place and get them back home, would you? He wanted the anointing where it belonged. Now, friends, let me tell you something. Those of you that are aging like me in this room, you're not done. You're not finished. We need you more than ever. And I don't want one young adult or young person there saying, we don't need you. The wisdom these men and women have is ridiculous. They will save you from stuff. If you just say, hey, Pop, tell me what happened in, back then. Just ask them for some information. They can't give it unless you ask it. And tonight, I believe what God is doing in this place is a work of Holy Ghost unity where the entire family gets to go to the same church and watch each other grow in the word of the Lord. Can you say amen? Church, I love you with all my heart. Keep us in your prayers in Miami, Florida. We're fighting some big battles, but we're winning because we're right. We serve Jesus. He's the Savior, the healer, the baptizer, the soon coming King. I'm not turning my back on Jesus. Hallelujah. The best is yet to come. I love you.